What'd you think? <laughs> Pretty amazing, takes your breath away, makes you cry. <laughs> I'd like to um, ask Diane Puzlovsky to come up. She's the Executive Director of Environmental Traveling Companions. She's going to introduce Eric, and Eric and Michael are gonna come up and do some Q&A. Come on up, Diane. Hi, everybody, and thank you so much for being here. Um, I don't know about you, but I cried through half of that. <laughs> um, I'm pretty taken. I've seen the film before, but seeing it on the big screen really uh, took my breath away and really touched my heart. Um, when I was 25 years old, I had the opportunity to do a 45-day trip in the Grand Canyon. And uh, I was in a boat with someone I highly respected, Gar Dubois and he fell climbing Vasey's Paradise shortly into the trip. And I ended up having to take that boat the rest of the trip and it really um, helped define who I am and I think in many ways is why I direct this organization to this day. So I have incredible respect for the Grand Canyon. And um, can we have a, a, a huge shout out? I, was, I tried to call him but he's not answering. Um, Harlan couldn't be here but like, what an amazing guide, right? <laughs> that man is the epitome of humility and incredible love. Um, I want to thank all of you for being here, old time ETC friends and family, and new people to Environmental Traveling Companions. And I want to thank CFI and Docklands. And, um, for this incredible collaboration. Your team's amazing. I want to thank Megan Kuzma, our administrative director, for putting this together. And um, she had her own, own challenge with a, a really bad back, and she hung in there. And uh, was, this event was her own little mini ever, <laughs> Star Green Canyon. So thank you, Megan. Let's hear from Megan. And, uh, as other people did, I want to thank Rich Robbins for being a visionary of Docklands and for greasing the wheels of this collaboration. So thanks to Rich and Nancy for all their support in our community of et cetera, of this theater and of Docklands. Et cetera, for those of you who don't know, is a local nonprofit organization that does outdoor adventure and environmental education programming for over 3,500 people a year, people with all kinds of abilities and under-resourced youth. And um, for over, well, for 46 years now, we've been doing outdoor adventures and you know, you can't say what you don't love and you can't love what you don't know. And so what we're all about is getting people to know this beautiful planet and challenging themselves in an inclusive community. And so thanks for being part of that effort and community. We really appreciate it. We have four programs, and we're a local organization in San Francisco. And uh, we've been at it for a really long time and uh, work with over 90 agencies. We have an incredible collaboration with No Barriers. And that's, that's where I first met Eric. And, um, no Barriers is an organization that Mark Wellman and Eric founded. And um, Jim, you were really involved in that as well. Thank you so much. And you know, this is Harlan uh, calling me. Uh, I'm sliding. OK, Harlan, are you there? It's Renee. Oh, no. Well, we, we, I'm at Docklands, and we just wanted to um, give a little round of applause to Harlan, but uh, we'll do it to you, too. Hey, there's Harlan right there. Woo! Hey, Harlan. We love you. Hi, Renee. <laughs> okay, well, I'll talk to you later. Bye. <laughs> That was an experiment, y'all. Uh-oh, I better get off. <laughs> um, so No Barriers is this amazing organization that where over 
close to 1,000 people come together every year, and they basically stretch themselves and learn about what's possible. And that's where I first met Eric. And you know, there's folks that have a different kind of DNA, right? They process fear differently and are driven to physical feats that transcend what most of us would dream of doing, whether it's free climbing El Cap or paddling Lava Falls with a Bluetooth waterproof headset. But Eric isn't just a member of that crazy wild tribe. He's also um, taken his personal and collective accomplishments to serve humanity and to lionize inclusion and diversity and to create a movement that encourages everyone to harness barriers and challenges and use them to propel, to create alchemy, and to recognize what's within us is stronger than what's in our way. We're deeply honored to have Eric Weinmayer and his, and Ellen, and his posse here tonight. So, <laughs> Eric, come on up. And Michael, too. Let's hear it for Eric and Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Here's a, a microphone awesome. for you, and there's one for you. So I think uh, you're all feeling kind of the way I am about this, this whole film. It's pretty amazing, and it is such a wild ride and a beautiful ride. It's wonderful. Thank you for making this. Thank you for taking your trip, Eric. Thank you for dreaming another goal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I don't know, I mean, when th the first thing that springs to my mind is what, what was scarier, the water or the, or the mountain? That's the first thing that came into my mind. Well, first I want to say uh, thanks to Diane. That was really beautiful. And uh, uh, yeah, awesome. No barriers. We partnered with uh, ETC, and we went out off to the uh, Sea of Cortez, the uh, Baja Peninsula last year, and uh, we had an amazing time. We took a bunch of disabled folks. Uh, we were sea kayaking and swimming with um, w with sea lions, and um, we were swimming with uh, whale sharks. And uh, so ETC is the real deal, and it's great to be affiliated with you guys. And I also want to make sure, you know, it's funny. It's people are like, you know, Eric Weinmayer, but they don't realize that this is the man. Whoa, there you are. <laughs> this is the man. This is Michael Brown. He made this thing. My, my goal was to kayak the Grand Canyon. Michael's uh, No Barriers Pledge was to work incredibly tirelessly for three years and finish this thing. And as you know, adventure films, there's not like people throwing money your way. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's just Michael and his team, a bunch of editors that he'd bring aboard, uh, and, uh, and he, he carved this thing um, out of tons of footage, and I, I think he nailed it. So thanks, Michael. He did. And what was the question? <laughs> Maybe it's irrelevant. <laughs> I just wanted to know what you f what, maybe what you enjoyed more, the depths of the canyon or the heights of, the, of Mount Everest? Well, I started climbing, as you saw, when I was 16, and the mountains were what I knew. And, you know, as a blind person, it's really hard to understand things, right? You can't, like, just go check out a mountain on, 
you know, uh, on, on the IMAX screen or uh, check out a rapid on Wide World of Sports, you know, you have to experience it. So I'd experienced mountains. I really understood it. It was slow and methodical, but rivers were crazy and insane. Um, you know, a completely different wiring. Uh, you had to not just sort of move forward methodically, but sort of accept this massive energy that you're trying to ride the surface of. It was a lot about, um, Harlan kept repeating it over and over through the film, about letting go and just letting it in and, and, and not, uh, n not trying to erect all these barriers between me and the river. Great. And Michael, did you jump in right away, right from the start when Eric, did you, Eric, you went to him with this thought first? Well, I went to like eight other filmmakers and they kept turning me down. <laughs> yes. And finally, no. <laughs> Your number one choice. <laughs> Michael and I are like brothers. We've made, we made that film in 2001 and then we took uh, some blind kids to uh, these blankets from Tibet up a 23,000 foot peak in a beautiful film. And we climbed a 20,000 foot peak in Nepal with 10 injured soldiers uh, that became one of the beginnings of No Barriers. So Michael and I are like brothers. We've been doing incredible things and teasing each other for a long time. Um, in fact, he's done some really uh, mean things to me. Uh, like, um, Putting horseradish in my pancakes. That was, Ellie. <laughs> that was Ellie. She will vouch for that. <laughs> <laughs> but he's also a good guy as well. And uh, although he was irritating in this film because he would come up to me in his ducky and he would, I'd be at the top of a rapid trying to relax and like clear my mind. He'd go, What are you thinking? What are you thinking? What are you thinking? And I'm like, I'm trying not to think right now, Michael. <laughs> now, he's like an irritating fly. <laughs> <laughs> it worked. He swam. <laughs> and and you didn't. You never questioned his his idea to do this, Michael. Did you? Hmm. <laughs> well, we'd climbed Everest together, and and that would, it really was a lot of filmmakers in that case. And they asked me to help find a filmmaker, and it was really hard to do. And I was finally, I just said, okay, fine, I'll do it. And I'm glad I did. It turned out to really define my life. Um, but uh, yeah, so the, it, I think we're back to the annoying part or? <laughs> <laughs> oh, did I say yes right away? I did kind of because it was the last second. Uh -huh. All those other filmmakers said no. And then finally Eric called me and said, we're going down the Grand Canyon. Do you want to go? And I'm like, my wife is really pregnant. <laughs> But the baby's not coming until February, so I have time for this. So yeah, we, that's how it worked. But, but it, yeah, I, having done a lot of things be, together before, I, I had a sense that it was going to be possible. Everest, I wasn't sure. It took, took me a while to be convinced that it was going to work out. In fact, it took everybody a while to, get, to be convinced it worked out. And the Grand Canyon almost went too smoothly. Because in fact, the only swim Eric did in the entire Grand Canyon was Lava Falls. And thank goodness he did, huh? <laughs> Michael's actually a really uh, perfect team member because like on Everest, you know, films can be really tough because uh, they're another thing that separate you from the experience because there's this whole crew with a different agenda sometimes, slowing you down or like, you know, making you wait for the right lighting. And I'm like, the right lighting? What does that even mean? I don't get that. <laughs> um, and, and so, uh, Michael is an amazing team member because he's a team member first, and uh, you know he's he's kind of ruined me for other film teams because Michael just insinuates himself into the team and it's a it, you know he he's there for you first. I knew on Everest, for instance, if like something bad happened, Michael would be there. You know he'd drop that camera and he'd he'd be there, part of the team. Uh, so uh, Michael. It's, you know, he was my first choice for sure. <laughs> that was a story. <clears throat> Hi, little buddy. I think we'll open up questions so anybody out there can get some of their questions answered. Yes, do we have mic runners? Somebody with a mic? Oh, no? Shout them out then.
could everybody hear the question? No. no? How, how do you deal with the fear, um, not knowing, n not knowing what's, what's ahead of you, more or less? Well, it's, you're just putting your finger on the hard part of kayaking, blind. It's, uh, <laughs> um, it is uh, incredibly uncertain, and, and uh, that I talked, you know, I, I was kind of clear in the movie about the fear, you know, uh, kayaking hands down was, you know, hardest thing I ever did. And uh, it was a step up from anything I'd ever done because things are coming at you so fast and there's such uncertainty. And I, I know that in the next like minute and a half, there's just crazy things that are going to be happening to my, to my boat and to me. And, um, I don't want to make a mistake because I don't want to go into a part of the, I mean, within a split second, you can be in the worst part of the river that you don't want to be in. And um, so for me, there is that massive uncertainty. And that also would sometimes become this pressure, this weight that I would hold on top of me. And again, Harlan was this incredible role model and guide for me as he just said, like, let go of that stuff. Uh, and I think that was the hardest thing to do, to just let go of that stuff and be there. Because it's this weird counterintuitive way to operate. Because if you are fearful and you're defensive, you actually create a, a harder, da more dangerous situation. You what you you have to be, you have to be uh, sort of aggressive and lean in to all the you know massive forces of the river, and then let those forces carry you forward. Uh, and so it, it's just a really uh, weird, counterintuitive, illogical lesson that Harlan was talking about. And for me, it kind of moved beyond rivers even. Wow. Yes. Were there, was there more filming going on because there were other uh, camera or helmet cams happening? Well, we, we, we had three different camera setups. Andy Mazur had a large camera called a RED, and he would ride in the raft. Generally, the plan was that he would ride down below the rapids and set up for a great shot. And then I would just try to stay close so I could get sync sound and basically the, the story and, and bother Eric with what his thoughts were. Because for me, I'm, I'm not a great kayaker, uh, and I actually drank some beer out of my shoe as well. But, <laughs> but um, I, I wanted to, I, I knew from my own experience kayaking that it's the lead up that's where everything happens. Once you're in it, there's not much you can do, but it's those moments before you go into the rapid where things start to get really intense. And so I would try to shoot that way. But I also, like at Lava Falls, I rode, I put the, my boat onto a raft and went down below to wait for the carnage. Uh, um, <laughs> and luckily, we got the carnage. Um, <laughs> I can't help myself. I'm sorry. I'm actually not a bad person. But <laughs> uh, Anyway, so that, but then it was very fortunate because the, the members of the team also had to have the presence of mind because, yes, we all had these GoPros on the cameras and on helmets, and Skyler had one on his helmet, and Harlan had this mount, this what we call a chesty mount. So he had a, that camera was so critical. And I remember when, we, when I first looked at the footage of that, the first run of lava, and I was just thinking, oh, thank God we have this footage because you could hear him talking. And it's that point of view, he's seeing Eric from his point of view. And so that footage that's underwater, of course, is these GoPro cameras. And so whatever happens, I mean, what an amazing tool to allow us to just sort of be there with them. And I, I, honestly, though, on, on the other side, I hate those GoPro cameras because they're like growths sprouting out of Eric's helmet on the front of his boat. And it's just like, oh, no, another one of these. So we tried to get those out when we could. But when we needed them, we definitely had the GoPros rolling on the 
on those things. Hey, Joni, I've got the next one right here in front of you. Oh, great. Thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm interested in the differences, the different experiences that you had and Lonnie had and how you attacked the river or, or in that challenge. And I'm wondering how he got down through Lava Falls, because, I mean, it, he says that he has these people talking to him, but I don't know how you could possibly hear anyone talking when you're in that place. And so I'm just curious about that. I could answer the Lava Falls part, and then you can answer the part between the differences, because I'll tell you, you know, when you make a film, it, it starts out really long. And of course, Lonnie's run of Lava Falls was in there. And I've never seen someone roll a kayak as quickly as he did in Lava Falls. He got knocked over, but it was like almost on purpose or something, because he was just like less than a half a second. He's up again. It just was part of his run through Lava Falls. And it was in the film up until a point where we realized that the emotional impact of Eric's run would be lost if we took a diversion to Lonnie's story. But now I'll let Eric talk about their no. bromance, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, La, uh, Lonnie was in the Grand Canyon uh, once before and did some of the, and did the river and he, he, uh, he swam through lava too. So I think we both had a nice blind swim through lava falls actually. Um, but yeah, no, Lonnie just has an incredible head for kayaking. He's just, it's really amazing. He, maybe it was his uh, days in the Navy uh, he was in a submarine, like he got stuck in the, like this compartment below the submarine where he was cleaning it and it like, and it, and it dropped and it compressed. He was stuck in there for 24 hours. He just, he just has this incredible head for what he does. We call him Lonnie the Lawn Dart. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and that translates to his life. You know, he roofs houses as you saw and he, he mows the lawn um, on his farm. Um, and he has a pond uh, in his farm, and I said, Lonnie, how do you know that you're, you know, getting close to the pond? And he said, when I start swimming. Uh, <laughs> so he's just able, he would always tell me, it's like, Eric, don't bleed before you cut. And, uh, and so I, 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 I envy Lonnie in so many ways because he's just able to, clear his mind and be so there. Uh, and so I, I, a lot of times on the river, I wished I could, I could be Lonnie. <laughs> uh, but we're all sort of born with certain fears and reservations. And, and, uh, and so, yeah, Lonnie and I are just two different people. And uh, we're, you know, I, I like more precision. I like to know where I am. Lonnie just kind of guns for it. We've got um, a question there. Yeah, hi, Eric. Um, at some point in the film, you say that you hate when people say that um, anything is possible, but you certainly prove that a lot of things are possible. So can you expand a little bit about that or why you don't like that? Uh, I think that's a perfectly fine phrase. And um, people mean well when they say it. But it, it, it becomes sort of one of these cliches, I think, in the world it becomes a motivational poster. You know, people are like, anything is possible. Anything is possible. And it's like, well, no, I'm pretty sure if anything were possible, I'd be, you know, racing NASCAR. Uh, <laughs> and that, that's the next movie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I think barriers are real. You know, I think they are real in the world. They're not, as I said, perceived. They're, they're real things. And um, I think what happens, I think, is that people kind of sometimes, those barriers, they just get too much for people. And they, you kind of get shoved to the sidelines. And you get into those prisons that I, I talked about in the film. And uh, so I, no, I think they are real. And I think uh, they want to knock you flat on your back. And what, you, what, what we're trying to do is to live a life that matters. And, uh, and, and so, yeah, no, I, I, I think those barriers um, are, are not just you know, in our minds. Um, I hope that explains that. Next question's down here. I do have a question, but I just want to really thank you all for showing such humanity and compassion and love and courage 
I'm over um, here. Um, just a beautiful relationship of men with each other, which um, you know we're not seeing on the national platform at all, and so it's just very healing for all of us, I'm sure. Um, but the second thing is just how did you get the film funded and how much did it cost? Because I'm, I'm very interested in how you manage the financing. It's very tough, and I, I, how much did it cost and how are you doing and, you know, um, let us know. <laughs> please, please let us know, because I think that's an important piece for every one of the films that are shown. Thank you. <laughs> Whoa, that's the uncomfortable question, is how much did it cost? Um, and how did we get the funding? Uh, and what do we need? What we need now is for a lot of people to pre-order it on iTunes and Vimeo On Demand and things like that. Um, I'm not sure I'm supposed to be doing that right in front of everybody, but, um, and you could like the Facebook page. Uh, but yeah, we hope to, to uh, we're, we're working hard to try to get the word out about the film, and I think that's the function of the festivals, and especially, uh, you know, this is our theatrical release, is, is Docklands and other film festivals, um, and so this is our chance to get the word out that this film is worth seeing. Um, and so, Back to the budget question, there were two separate parts of this because obviously going down the river was very expensive and we did have a sponsor for that. Nature Valley came through to uh, provide the money because Eric had actually agreed nicely to do some commercials with his beautiful daughter, Emma, and they're out running and doing commercials for these uh, granola bars, right? Yeah. And uh, uh -huh. so they put up the money to get us down the river and to get a crew to go along. And then we had the other half of it, which I spent probably spent more money than I needed to because it took so long. I had two kids during the process and frankly sort of we had some motivational issues um, to fin finish the film and people were saying, well, why don't you do this stupid, get it done. Um, but it is expensive and it's hard and really it comes right down to the very last part and I always knew that that was looming out there and we had to find it is there are two components to a film that are so critically important and one is the sound to do the proper mix, not just to record the sound, but to actually make the bad sound that I recorded on location and make it actually sound good. And I'm a did... sound engineer. <laughs> yeah, and, and knowing who the, the, you know, one of my first audience is gonna be a guy that cares about the sound a lot. Um, but we mixed over here, over the hill in, at Skywalker, and they gave us a great rate, um, festival rate, to do that. And then had an incredible composer from LA called Chris Bacon, and he just landed uh, the new Men in Black, and it, that was a hugely disproportionate amount of money in the budget because I really wanted this one guy to do the composition, but I could not afford him, not even close, but we've, we found a way to make it work. But uh, I think in the end we're probably, I might regret saying this, but I think we spent probably 350000 on the film. Um, Thank you for saying that. <laughs> it's it's not a huge budget in the in the world of big budgets, but it's uh, you know maybe the next one will spend a million. I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do with all that money though. What do you do with all that money? <laughs> I think you'll figure it out. <laughs> we were on the river for what was it? 21 days. Yeah. 21 days, and then I spent another three and a half years editing. <laughs> I told Michael, I said, you're gonna do, you got to finish this thing. I'm going to be old and bald, and they're going to be like, I'm going to be up there on stage, and they're going to say, is that the same guy? Yeah. <laughs> My kids are going to be all grown up. And, um, In a wave pool. <laughs> yeah. Well, we certainly had to work with what we had as far as on location, but I, I can go back to example on Everest, because on, on Everest, when we got to the South Summit, it was just such a beautiful morning. And, you know, this is our chance to get the, these beautiful shots of the sunrise on Everest, but the fixed lines were going behind my back. And so Eric and the team were walking towards me, and I'm with a camera on my shoulder, and every time they pull, it's doing this. And I was crying. I was just like, 
oh my God, I just lost this shot because this rope is pulling on me. And Eric and the team actually turned around and walked down a few steps on the top of Mount Everest, not quite there to get to make this happen. But I think working together, I just know it's like that's my primary mission is not to interfere with what's going on. And Eric was having enough challenges on the river. So um, I think for Lava Falls, though, I, I think that the, the uh, tail did wag the dog a little bit there because we were trying to get a it's, it's a long story, but the, the production did delay. And it, to, to take this story even further into absurdity is that I did have a microphone on Eric and I'd record for hours on end everything he said while he was in his boat because that's how we got that sound in the river. And there were times when he was pretty upset with what was happening and um, Harlan was talking him off the ledge. It's like, it's all right, we agreed we'd do this rapid. It's okay, he can shoot this one. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I've got some blackmail material. Yeah. We well. <laughs> I got blackmail material on Michael because the, he didn't even, he undermined that story uh, of the summit because he, we got to the summit behind Michael, and, or at, in front of Michael, and um, he thought he had missed the shot, and he was up there, and he's crying, and I missed the shot, and, and so we actually stepped down, and, we, and one of the guys helped the camera on, up onto his shoulder, and we, uh, we re, redid the summit of Everest, uh, so... Uh, so I, we saved the day you did. for you. And then um, with lava, I, when I went, see, I think I defeated myself, you know, just like waiting there on the side of lava uh, in the sun, and I hadn't eaten. And so I, I feel like I defeated myself. And when I went back, I told Harlan, I said, I want to go back and try this thing again. Um, I said, I don't want like a lot of fanfare. Like, I don't, you know, I, I don't want all the camera crews and everything. It's just too much pressure. I just want to go back and do it. And so I went back and I did it. And afterwards, I learned that they were filming it. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so I thought I was being all sneaky, just going back. I was just going to do this thing, do it for myself. And uh, little did I know. <laughs> We've got one more question right there. So thank you. Um, Michael and Eric for a truly inspirational film, and uh, we need this kind of inspiration more than ever. But the question now, I think maybe for both of you, this took years to conceive, train for, and then pull off. Do you have another, do you have your next venture uh, in mind? And, and it sort of relates to another aspect of that, and, and it's this is for Eric. Do you sort of, live sort of from episode to episode you have you have, you know you've got your beautiful family along with you but do you kind of orient that way a little bit yeah our next adventure we already have it set michael he we built this gigantic uh cannon and i and we're shooting me out of it up over everest and, and i and i'm going to be in a squirrel suit and i'm going to fly and you over haven't... onto the land on the Tibetan Plateau. And this is the first time Michael's hearing of it. Yeah. 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 It's kind of the way it works. So I'm going to sign him up for that. Uh, no, I'm really careful. In fact, um, people think that I'm like, you know, like a blind evil Knievel or something. And I'm not. I mean, I'm, I'm really not looking for ways to kill myself. Uh, I, I love my life. I love my family. My wife, Ellie's back there. Um, Jim Goldsmith, jo Jim and Connie Goldsmith are back there, the f some of the founders of No Barriers. I love my friends. I love my life. I'm not looking to do the next stunt. Uh, things have to feel meaningful to me. And so, yeah, I'm continuing to climb and kayak, mostly climbing these days. I'm going back to a peak, uh, Amada Blom, 22 uh, and a half thousand foot peak that I failed at 20 years ago. I'm um, going in November with uh, my team. We had kind of a disaster, kind of like my first Lava Falls swim. And uh, I know we can do better. So I'm going to go back and close that circle. But, uh, and I also want to really grow No Barriers. No Barriers is uh, we're working with about 13,000 people a year now, folks with challenges uh, similar to ETC. And so we, uh, I want to grow this thing. I think somebody just mentioned that, that we need this right now. I think we do need this. We need this no barriers message, this, this positive message that we can lean in together and we can do a 
just really great things if we trust each other. And uh, so, so for me, that's really where I'm devoting a lot of time. Thank you. And thank you both for being here, for the beautiful film, and for the wonderful adventure. We'll be looking forward to the next one. Yeah, the Whatever. rocket. Yeah, the rocket. <laughs> thank you all for coming.